Hello friends, this is Vinayak Rengen and I am the founder of Search Test and I am also a pediatric surgery resident. So today we are going to talk about a very very interesting topic, fetal surgery, something which is not discussed at general surgery level in many institutes and a new chapter has been included in the Sabiston 21st edition. So um, fetal surgery is, is, a, is a very niche branch of surgery and one of the biggest motivations for me to enter into uh, pediatric surgery was the growth of fetal surgery. Uh, this particular field of surgery has seen exponential growth in the past uh, uh, few decades and it is not yet picked up in India but over the next few years we're going to see tremendous rise in the uh, uh, use of fetal intervention to save uh, tiny humans. So let's talk about fetal surgery. In this particular module we're going to be discussing uh, the indications of fetal surgery. We're going to be discussing uh, the specific conditions in which fetal surgery is being performed. We're going to be discussing in detail about meningomyelocele but before we do all that sort of stuff we are going to be discussing history. Uh, as a history enthusiast and as a history buff, I always feel that people who tend to ignore history tend to repeat the same mistakes. So here is father of fetal medicine, Dr. Kipros Nikolaitis. He is a Greek Cypriot obstetrician and gynecologist who pioneered the use of fetal ultrasound in diagnosis of many congenital anomalies, who pioneered the use of fetoscopy for uh, fetal interventions and has published a huge amount of work, especially in the field of twin to twin reverse uh, uh, arterial perfusion, twin to twin transfusion syndrome. There was a very interesting episode about him uh, in a docu-series called Surgeon's Cut on Netflix and full kudos to Netflix for uh, showing uh, or demonstrating about this niche field of surgery to millions of viewers. The father of fetal surgery is Dr. Michael Harrison. Uh, he performed the first uh, vesicoamniotic shunt uh, in a child with low urinary tract obstruction and uh, the distant bladder was compressing the lungs too. Uh, the, that child couldn't survive but the second child in which he performed the surgery uh, survived and he's also named Michael. I think it's Michael Wiener and he must be around 30 years old and the fact that these kids are surviving is a testimony to the efforts of a greats such as Dr. Michael Harrison. It is on shoulders of these gi giants um, that is this particular field has evolved and has reached this particular level. Today we have numerous fetal surgery centers in the US, a couple of them in uh, London, uh, Barcelona and Paris. A few centers are also emerging in India. This field is still nascent in India and we hope to see the growth of it in the next few years. Fetal intervention started pretty early. In fact, Lily performed the first uh, fetal exchange transfusion in 1960. Uh, 1970s and early 80s saw the growth of fetal ultrasound and Dr. Nicolaides uh, played a major role in it. The first open fetal surgery was performed by Dr. Harrison in 1980. The first fetoscopic attempt to spina bifida repair were by Tulipan and Brunner in 1990 and the first open fetal spina bifida repair was performed by Adzik. And the MOMS trial, the legendary MOMS trial which actually pioneered the use of fetal surgery for meningomyelocele and which encouraged the adoption of it all over the world uh, was in the 2000s. So here's a very interesting image, uh, a very famous image of uh, Tulipan and Brahma uh, attempting the first fetoscopic repair of spina bifida at Vanderbilt University. Fetal surgery is very interesting because there are two patients. The mother is the innocent bystander and the fetus is the actual surgical patient. It is very important that we acknowledge the mother in the entire process because it is because of these hundreds of mothers and parents overall who allowed themselves to be subject to fetal interventions, who allowed their chi unborn child to be subject to fetal interventions that this field has grown. And we owe a lot to these people who allowed themselves to be operated when these procedures were actually unproven. So here's a very famous painting. Uh, of this painting stands on my desk as well. Uh, this is by my favorite painter, Raja Ravi Verma. Not really contextual, but I felt that I had to include this. One of the biggest challenges we face in fetal surgery is metal morbidity. This is very similar to a liver transplant where donor mortality or morbidity is considered unacceptable. So entire programs have been uh, shut down because of donor mortality or morbidity. So in fetal surgery, we face the same thing. Uh, programs can be shut down if they have any sort of mortality in the mother. So we'll be discussing some of the challenges which we face uh, in fetal surgery with regards to the mother. Opening the gravid uterus without bleeding is a very, very big challenge. In fetal surgery, we open the uterus, the hysterotomy is performed, something very similar to a classical cesarean section in a vertical manner. Uterus is a very uh, vascular organ and it tends to bleed. Maintaining uterine relaxation is extremely important because 
uterine contraction can constrict the utero placental circulation and can lead to premature labor, can lead to compromise of fetal circulation. Closure of histotomy in a watertight manner is very essential because we don't want the amniotic fluid to leak out. Limiting postoperative preterm labor is also extremely important and that is something which uh, uh, has been the Achilles heel in entire fetal surgery because we still have not been able to uh, surmount this particular challenge. Fetal surgery is, is used in a variety of conditions but it is a standard of care in advanced cases of 2 to transfusion syndrome and certain cases of meningomyelosy. So this is a table from Sabiston 21st edition. Uh, it lists the conditions amenable for fetal intervention. Uh, it is comprehensive but not exhaustive. Uh, meningomyelocele, 20 to transfusion syndrome, trap sequence, CDH, tumors causing high drops, sacrococcygeal teratoma, CPAM, cervical teratoma, some uh, thing very interestingly named as chaos, congenital high airway obstruction syndrome, amniotic band syndrome, urinary tract obstruction, renal agenesis, congenital heart disease and fetal anemia. In fetal anemia, we perform transfusions and it's very interesting to note that congenital heart disease can also be treated by fetal interventions. We use animal models to perform a lot of these experiments and uh, we use, uh, most commonly we use the fetal ovine model. Uh, basically, we operate on lambs. Sheep has unique resistance to preterm labor and spontaneous abortion. Coming back to maternal risks, I know fetal surgery is essentially about the fetus, but risk to the mother assumes more importance than risk to the fetus. You can't risk anything happening to the mother. The biggest risk, as we told, is bleeding. Uterus is a vascular organ. And to um, uh, to solve this problem, people started using staplers. In early days, we used metallic staplers. But this particular metallic staplers tended to act like an intrauterine contraceptive device uh, preventing pregnancies, later pregnancies. So we started using synthetic or uh, plastic materials in the staplers. Choriamniotis is a major risk. We are opening the uterus, we are exposing the amniotic fluid, the risk of infection is always there. Placental abruption is a risk. PPROM can occur. Preterm labor as, and premature delivery, as we told previously, it is the Achilles heel. Uterine diseases and rupture is also a major issue. One of the major and most important reasons why we abandoned the classical caesarean section was the risk of uterine rupture. So, does it make sense to go for fetoscopic repair? Some would say yes. The risk of uterine diseases and rupture is definitely less. But the challenge of closing the uterus in a watertight manner in fetoscopic repair is also there. And another big challenge is the learning curve. A lot of surgeons who are performing fetal surgery have still not crossed the learning curve for fetoscopic repair. We are going to be talking about meningomyelosy. It is the most common one of the most common congenital defects and it is due to incomplete closure of the neural tube. The neural elements get exposed to the environment, the uterine wall, the amniotic fluid and this can lead to uh, developmental delays, this can lead to motor deficits, the spinal cord is uh, uh, element is exposed, neurological damage, uh, anulchery type 2 malformation, hydrocephalus, uh, loss of bowel and bladder function. So what is the rationale for prenatal surgery? We are not going to be discussed discussing in too much detail about MMC because that's going to be covered in a different module completely. But you're going to be discussing about MMC with regards to prenatal surgery. And what exactly is the rationale for prenatal surgery? This is the two hit hypothesis. The first hit is the embryological anomaly of the spinal cord. The only way to prevent this is to ensure active proper mutilation. And the best way to do that is folic acid supplementation. The second hit is the acquired injury due to the exposed neural elements. Inside the uterus, the injury can be twice, in two ways. One is the mechanical injury, which is due to the uterine wall. And the second one is the chemical injury due to the elements in the amniotic fluid. The only way to prevent this is early surgery. So the legendary MOMS trial uh, enrolled 183 participants and uh, they divided them into two groups. One was the early fetal intervention group and the other one was the uh, postnatal group. So the perinatal deaths in both groups were uh, less, there were two deaths in both the groups. The need for ventricular peritoneal shunt was at 12 months of age was 68% was in the first group and 98% in the second group, which showed that almost every kid who had undergone an intervention postnatally required a ventricular peritoneal shunt due to hydrocephalus. Actual shunting was performed in 82% in uh, the postnatal intervention group and 40% in the early fetal intervention group. The p-value was less than uh, 0 0.001, pretty significant. Decreased hindbrain herniation, 96% of kids had 
a hindbrain herniation in the postnatal intervention group and only 64% had it in the prenatal intervention groups. Again, extremely significant. The most interesting aspect was the improved ability to walk without processes. 42% in the intervention group, early intervention group and 21%, almost double in the postnatal intervention group. Again, extremely significant. And this particular trial paved the way and set the stage uh, for further fetal intervention and established early fetal intervention as a gold standard in many cases of meningomyelosis. What are the other uses? Sacrococcygeal teratomas. Sacrococcygeal teratomas can be absolutely frightening. As you know, a big tumor in the coccygeal region. Extremely vascular tumors. These kids have a huge difficulty uh, while delivering the fetus also. But the biggest risk is the uh, presence of non-immune fetal high drops uh, due to the excess circulation. Mortality is more than 50% in kids with non-immune eye drops. So in fetal intervention, we can either uh, uh, ablate it through radio frequency or we can go ahead and dissect it. And in many cases, we use something called as the exit procedure to secure the airway. The exit procedure is, so the exit procedure, exit procedure is something which we are going to be talking about in further slides. Teratoma and neck lesions. MRI is a must to characterize uh, lesions because the risk of complex airway is higher in teratoma. Again, we'll be talking about this uh, exit procedure in detail. But uh, for uh, neck lesions, cystic hygromas, aspiration or ablation is also used. Congenital lung lesions, congenital pulmonary airway mal uh, malformations, thoracoamniotic shunt, uh, resections and exit procedures are used. Gastroschisis, the evidence of intervention is still limited. Research is going on in animal models. Uh, there have been uh, um, uh, devices which have been used to prevent uh, uh, um, exposure of the uh, gut elements to the amniotic fluid. Uh, there has also been uh, uh, interventions in at the stem cell level in gastroschisis, but none of it has been actually used in uh, uh, humans. Lower urinary tract obstruction, amnio infusion uh, uh, for preventing oligohydramnios, valve ablation, and vesicoamniotic shunt. All these are interventions uh, which can be performed in the prenatal period. As we discussed earlier, lower urinary tract obstruction was the first fetal intervention to be performed. They performed a vesicoamniotic shunt. Uh, so here is an uh, thoracoamniotic shunt, uh, the uh, um, airway malformation of the fluid filled cyst is drained into the amniotic fluid. Fetal cardiac intervention is not very important from an examination point of view, uh, but the procedures done are an intrauterine balloon valvuloplasty and an atrial septoplasty. There are only three indications, it, severe aortic stenosis plus evolving hypoplastic heart syndrome. Pulmonary atresia plus intact ventricular septum plus an evolving hypoplastic right heart syndrome, a hypoplastic left heart syndrome with an intact or a highly restrictive aortic spectrum. Twin to twin transfusion syndrome. Uh, so many of you might have seen about this in the Netflix episode uh, about surgeon's cut. This occurs in monochorionic twins and 10% of all monochorionic twin pregnancies have twin to twin transfusion syndrome. An unbalanced transfusion between the donor twin and the recipient twin happens. So this results in discordant growth. The donor twin is small and the recipient twin becomes big because it basically derives blood supply from the donor twin. So there is polyhydramnios in the uh, recipient twin and there's oligohydramnios in the donor twin. So uh, we use a laser to ablate the offending uh, vascular combination. So here is the uh, anastomosis. Basically, the donor is donating blood to the recipient. So there's a superficial anastomosis and there's a deep anastomosis and we basically use laser interventions. Not a very difficult procedure, uh, not a very complex procedure, but definitely requires expertise. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia. CDH was the condition which actually prompted Dr. Michael Harrison to think about fetal surgery. It is associated with a variety of anomalies. So that's one of the reasons for its higher mortality. Open fetal repair has been abandoned due to a poor results. Uh, so we use something called as a plug technique, plug the lung until it grows. It is called FETO, fetoscopic endomyeluminal tracheal occlusion. So basically what happens is when the, so here is the trachea and here are the lungs. So when there is a diaphragmatic hernia, you know, so when there's a defect and you have organs pushing in, intra-abdominal organs pushing in, the lungs basically become smaller because they don't have place to grow. So what happens is when you occlude the lungs, occlude the trachea basically, 
the fluid normally bathed by the fetal lung parenchyma cannot escape out. And this causes the fetal lungs to swell out and grow. This leads to pulmonary hyperplasia. The major cause of death in CDH is pulmonary hypoplasia and the resultant pulmonary hypertension. And a very interesting technique has been FETO where we occlude the trachea and allow the lung to grow by plugging it, by not allowing the fluid made by the lung parenchyma to leak out. So here you can see there's a plug uh, which obstructs the fetal trachea. Exit procedure. Uh, exit procedure is a very interesting intervention in the field of fetal surgery. It is extrapartum uh, intrauterine treatment. So basically it is to stabilize the airway before the delivery is completed, before the utero-placental circulation stops. So what we do is we do a hysterotomy to deliver the fetus head and neck and we intubate the child. So this is done before the utero-placental circulation is compromised. Because once the uterus starts contracting, what happens is the utero-placental circulation is compromised and the breathing occurs through the lungs. The patent ductus arteriosus closes, the, uh, 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 the foramen ovale closes and the lungs start uh, uh, working. But when the lungs are not ready to start working, when we have to actually secure the airway, early on we use the exit procedure. So basically we do an histotomy to deliver the fetus head and neck and intubate the fetus. It can be either through a direct laryngoscope or a tracheostomy and decompression of the cystic lesion or resection can be done. Most important thing is complete uterine relaxation and preserving the uteroplacental circulation. There are basically uh, three gross or uh, sorry, four gross indications for exit. It can be an exit to an airway procedure. Basically what we do is that uh, uh, we do an exit and uh, we secure the airway. So it can be neck masses with obstruction, chaos syndrome, tracheal atresia, laryngeal atresia, micrognathia or other cause of airway obstruction. Exit to resection syndrome, basically there's a large intrathoracic mass or something which is compressing the airway. So we secure the airway, do the resection and then uh, uh, allow the delivery to progress and the uterus to contract. In severe cases of pulmonary hypertension and in pulmonary hypoplasia, uh, we can do an exit to ECMO procedure. We'll be talking about ECMO in another session. But basically, this is done in severe CDH and severe congenital heart disease. Exit to separation rare it can be done in the case of conjoint twins so basically we have covered most of the important aspects of fetal therapy uh, in this particular module we're going to be talking about few niche aspects of fetal surgery which have not been uh, yet started uh, to uh, uh, be implemented in humans some of them have been started but uh, not at a mass level Intrauterine stem cell therapy for hemoglobinopathies, congenital skeletal abnormalities and many more defects. Basically, we use bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells. The most important use has been in hemoglobinopathies, thalassemias. The immature uh, fetal immune system uh, 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 can cause fetal chimerism when we actually inject uh, the bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells. So basically, this is a non-ablative method and avoids the use of a bone marrow transplantation at a later stage postnatally. After this chimeris, chimeric uh, of, uh, uh, blood cells are formed in a child with thalassemia, a second booster bone marrow can be done and this booster bone marrow transplant is more effective than doing the first bone marrow transplant uh, uh, postnatally. So uh, mesenchymal stem cells are used in uh, congenitive tissue disorders such as uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. The research is still ongoing and uh, there is a lot to do more. Uh, Transamniotic stem cell therapy, Traset, is used in gastroschisis. Basically, in gastroschisis, the uh, bowel elements, as you know, the bowel elements are exposed. And they are exposed to the amniotic fluid. So, this is the fetal abdomen. And when these are exposed to the amniotic fluid, uh, the uh, levels of irritation cause bowel edema. And this does, makes it very difficult to, for a postnatal intervention. But this amniotic fluid also has a healing tendency in the form of stem cells. Basically, when we do a transamniotic uh, st uh, stem cell therapy, we inject stem cells into the amniotic fluid. We are essentially increasing the load of stem cells in the amniotic fluid, which increases the healing aspect of amniotic fluid, by thereby decreasing the harmful aspect of amniotic fluid. Fetal tissue engineering. Basically, we use uh, placental mesenchymal stem cells along with the extracellular matrix scaffold. We use this to provide a cover for meningomyelosis. This uh, PMSE ECM scaffold allows ambulation after birth 
but the bone is still deficient bone scaffolds are still emerging and at a very early stage so here is a uh, image so this is the exposed neural elements this is a ovine model so we place this scaffold over here and then we close it so this acts as a scaffold in which uh, tissues can deposit and the neural elements are protected intrauterine gene therapy is also uh, uh, in its early stages and they have been used in certain fetal mouse models for correcting certain lung anomalies uh, we use uh, genetic editing turn, uh, tools such as crispr cas9 and also uh, what you call as an adeno associated vector human factor 9 uh, it is a late it's a technique of uh, doing late gestation gene transfer you're not going to be elaborating much on this because these are still at an experimental stage one very interesting thing i wanted to talk to you about uh, before we end this module is so you have performed a fetal therapy or even if you're not performed a fetal therapy uh, a child has been born uh, at a very early stage 20 weeks 22 weeks the fact that modern surgery and modern medicine has led to the development of something called as an artificial placenta is simply amazing it is basically a bag in which uh, which simulates the uh, amniotic fluid it's like it simulates a womb so it's filled with fluids and uh, there is also an artificial fetal circulation uh, kind of a chamber in which the fetal heart pumps blood but uh, it is oxygenated in a different chamber and uh, the technology is still emerging we are still at an animal model level uh, but we are hopeful that this particular technology will be useful in saving a huge number of premature lives and um, allowing the field of fetal surgery to progress faster uh, thank you so much uh, i think it was a delight uh, talking to you guys about uh, this very interesting topic and uh, any doubts about this topic or any other topic you can contact me at my email vinayak.rengan@searchless.com thank you so much guys